Here's an idea. What if we could make ourselves immune to fire damage, then grapple an enemy or two and cast heat metal on ourselves, forcing our enemies to take fire damage every round that they can't escape our grapple, while we laugh with glee at their plight? Sounds fun, right? Want to find out how to build it? Good, then keep watching. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, every week I do a deep dive into a character build for my favorite role-playing games. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you like the right way or the best way necessarily to play a character, but to explore one potential way to build something with the hopes of creating a character that's both really fun but also really powerful to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. Uh, so thank you for being here. My name's Colby, and I'm so glad that you're watching. I put out these build videos every Tuesday, so if you like what you see, I would really appreciate it if you'd consider joining the channel as a member. There's a little button down there below the video that says join. If you click on it, it'll tell you about all the potential perks that you can get by being a channel member, anything from access to the write-ups that I create for each of these builds to help you recreate them yourself a little more easily, to access to the D4 community Discord server that's filled with tons of lovely, amazing people, and even access to the monthly hangout live Q&A sessions that we do. Huge thank you and shout out to all of my channel members. You guys are so awesome. I could not do this without you. And everybody else, you are also awesome. Just being here and watching and liking and subscribing and clicking on the notifications bell. These are all great ways to support the channel too. So if you don't want to be a member or you don't feel like you can afford it or whatever, that's totally fine. I appreciate you regardless. So, right. I've had this idea on my to-do list for ever. Make yourself immune to fire damage, grapple an enemy, heat metal. There are variations on this theme, of course. Make yourself immune to poison damage and then grapple an enemy and hold them in cloud kill, etc., etc. But Here's the big hurdle to the tactic. Immunity to damage types is pretty dang hard to come by for PCs in D&D 5e. Resistance? Sure. Resistance is as cheap as a two copper mug of ale. But immunity? Outside of maybe some rare magic items or high level spells or high level class features, which most of us aren't even going to see before our campaign ends, most of the time anyways, it's very, very hard to come by. Enter the dragon. The uh, dragonborn, that is. Specifically, the chromatic dragonborn that we got in Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. This race, like most dragonborn, gets to choose a draconic ancestry that not only lets them determine the damage type of their breath weapon attack, right, and gives them resistance to that damage type, but uniquely chromatic dragonborns also get immunity to that damage type as well once they hit level 5, at least once per day. Anyways, I kind of forgot about that little fact for a while. If I would have remembered it sooner, I would have done this build a long time ago, but yes. While I was brainstorming this build yet again earlier this week, I kind of accidentally stumbled upon this little nugget that had been buried in my brain, and suddenly it all came together. Build an amazing grappler who has access to the heat metal spell and make yourself immune to fire damage and give all of your enemies a nice fiery embrace. Brothers don't shake hands. Brothers gotta hug. It's perfect. But what is the best way to build it? I don't know about best, but I do know how I would do it. So get comfy and settle in for D&D build number 161, The Hot Squeeze. <laughs> the Carlac, the song of vice and fire. Get it? We've got him in a vice, right? Too hot to handle. Hunka hunka burnin' love. <laughs> the Panini Press. You know, big thanks to uh, everyone in the Discord community for those suggestions, as always. They're fantastic ones, but I think my favorite is just the warm hug. <laughs> maybe the too warm hug? It's like a really aggressive Olaf, maybe? Anyways, huge thank you to my friend Randall Hampton for the fantastic artwork that he put together for this build. He does this every week. He's so good at what he does. You guys know this. If you'd like to follow him on social media or maybe reach out to him to see if you could commission him to create some art for your character or even your entire party, I will put links in the video description, as always, on how to do so. But first, you guys, hang on, please, listen up. As I wax poetic, get it, wax, uh, about one of my favorite 
sponsors of all time, Tabletop Candle Company. Anyone who knows me knows that I am a total sensory junkie. Soft and comfy feels, beautiful vistas, haunting harmonies, and yes, lovely smells. These things are like primary motivators for joy in my life, and no sponsor to date has brought me more sensory pleasure than Tabletop Candle Company. They make candles inspired by your favorite D&D classes. My favorites are The Monk, Mmm. Oh my gosh, that's so good. Sage, orange, grapefruit, lavender, oak moss. Oh. Cleric. Oh my gosh, that just smells like just peace and harmony. Peonies, lavender, geranium, citrus, ginger. Mm. And perhaps best of all, druid. Oh my gosh, I could just smell that all day long. It is a fresh, flowery glade. Perfect for springtime, especially. But they also make more than just candles. They make a little, like, wax dice melters that you can play with, actually, or melt in a little wax melter for the same lovely aroma. But in addition to products inspired by character classes, they've recently launched their new Game Master collection that includes the uh, AM Game Master candle, which I've highlighted before. It's really yummy, like coffee smell and two new scents, which I've just received. PM Game Master, which is like whiskey, tonka bean, smoke, frankincense, myrrh, musk. Yeah, I could totally like get cozy in a tall backed leather chair with a good book by the fire with this one. And Storyteller, which is tobacco, cedar, teak wood, sandalwood, patchouli, citrus. Yeah, that's, that's a new favorite. Like, that's right up there with cleric and druid and monk for me. I love woodsy scents, and that is very woodsy. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I'm actually gonna light this and have it burning in the background here, because I want to be smelling it more. Move over, Zeph. Anyways, Please, please, you guys, go to tabletopcandlecompany.com and get yourself some delicious smelling candles. You will be so glad that you did. And also, use the promo code D4 at checkout to get both 20% off your order and discounted shipping costs. Such a good deal. Do not delay. Huge thank you to Tabletop Candle Company. You guys are freaking awesome. I love you so much. And yeah. Let's jump into the build. Okay, at level one for our starting class, let's start with Fighter. Yes, I know, a very good place to start that I use all the freaking time. <laughs> but for good reason. We actually really need a good three levels of fighter for this build to work best, and especially for that reason, we might as well start as fighter so that we can get that all-important constitution saving throw proficiency to help protect our concentration, among other things, as well as heavy armor proficiency, right? Right. As for our race, like I've already said, we're going to go with the chromatic dragonborn. Now, all chromatic dragonborn have to choose their chromatic ancestry, like which color of dragon we're descended from, essentially, and yes, of course, we are going to go with the classic red dragon, which is the only option that gives us the damage type of fire. This means that the breath weapon that we get, which we can use proficiency bonus times per day as an action to spew forth a 30 foot long, five foot wide line of, in our case, fire, right, to melt our hapless foes. The nice thing about this version of it, the version that the chromatic dragonborn specifically get, is that we can just replace one of our attacks with this breath weapon once we have extra attack anyways, which we will eventually. And I so appreciate that change from the original Dragonborn that we got in the player's handbook that just made us use our action specifically to do this breath attack, right? The enemies who get hit by it get to make a dexterity save for half damage, and it deals 1d10 fire damage for now, but scales with character levels, which is really great. We also, right at the beginning, get Draconic Resistance, giving us resistance to, for us, fire damage, and that's really nice, actually. It's a pretty common damage type that we're going to be going up against. So, yeah, it's great. We don't have immunity yet, but that will come at level 5. That's when we get the chromatic warding feature. I'll just talk about it now. It simply tells us that once per day and as an action, we can give ourselves immunity to, again, for us, fire damage for one minute. That's awesome. And it also frustrates me a little bit. <laughs> Maybe, like, immunity proficiency bonus times per day would be too often, but would it really? When they were creating this race, were they thinking, like, more than once per day is really too powerful, and why? Were they anticipating us swimming in a lake of lava all the time? Were they trying to prevent something, like putting heat metal on your own armor and then giving everybody a hug? I don't know. Bit of a bummer. Uh, we'll talk more about how to deal with that later. I also get a little peeved that it's an action to use. I know, 
playing Baldur's Gate 3 has spoiled me, take a drink, where in that game, right, you can basically predict when a fight's coming and, like, buff yourself up before engaging. I just hate spending early combat rounds, like, getting ready to do stuff instead of just doing stuff. Hey, Wizards of the Coast, maybe make more, like, self-buff things usable as reactions? Or even just free actions? Or maybe tweak the rules for the upcoming player's handbook to give everyone some kind of, like, setup action where when you roll initiative you can do one thing that's, like, not attacking or affecting another creature or something? I guess allowing for something like that would make subclasses like the champion fighter at all feel even less cool since like, maybe they don't have anything cool to do to buff themselves at the beginning of a fight, right? I don't know. Maybe if you don't have anything else you can do, you can use your movement when you roll initiative instead of, like, put a buff on yourself. Or, like, psych yourself up to get advantage on your first attack. Whatever. Too much theory crafting. Back to the build. Ability scores. I'm going to assume that we're going the point by method as always and say let's go with a 15 strength plus 2 from our racial there. A 15 constitution plus 1 and then a 14 charisma. I could could see us swapping that constitution and charisma and you'll see why later but I'll assume we're prioritizing constitution both for our saving throws and yeah for our health right plus our breath weapon saving throw DC is actually affected by our constitution too so yeah probably the better choice. As for equipment that we're going to start out with here, nothing too fancy. Just take kind of the standard stuff. Get some chain mail, get a shield. We actually are not even going to need weapons, so maybe just grab some javelins for ranged attacks when we need them for now. As a fighter one then, we get second wind first of all, which lets us heal ourselves for a d10 plus our fighter level once per short rest as a bonus action. And then we get a fighting style, and we want to go with unarmed fighting. This is the reason we don't need no stinking weapons. We are going to be a pugilistic street fighter brawler, uh, akin maybe to the street fighter build that I did a while ago, but maybe a little more spicy. Unarmed fighting style is great. It tells us that our unarmed strikes will hit for a d8 if we're not using, you know, any other weapons or a shield or anything, which we won't be. At least I'm not planning on it. I mean, you decide here early on if you want to use a shield, then you're unarmed strikes will be a d6 instead and it's probably worth giving up one damage on average for a plus two to our armor class right but before long i think we will want to drop the shield as we'll discuss anyways it also tells us that at the start of our turn we can just automatically deal an extra d4 of damage to an enemy that we're grappling not a ton but guaranteed damage is gonna kind of be a theme of this build and so i love every bit of it that we can get if they're grappled they just take damage no attack roll no saving throw just damage. But at level 2, I think we need to focus on grabbing heat metal since that's kind of the whole concept of the build, right? So the question is, which class is the best one to take in order to grab the spell? It's available to bards, druids, forge domain clerics only, and artificers. I'm going to nix artificers right off. They're cool, but most of our damage is going to come from this spell, which scales in damage with spell level and artificers as half casters scale too slowly in that regard for my taste. I'm going to rule out druids as well, mostly because of that frustrating druids will not wear metal armor language that we have currently in the rule set that thankfully, in my opinion, Wizards of the Coast is getting rid of uh, with the new player's handbook that's coming out later this year. You might be able to wear metal armor on your druid at your table, and if so, great, but I don't know that druids necessarily bring a ton to the build anyways, so yeah, let's nix them too. That's gonna leave us then with forge clerics and bards. And honestly, I went back and forth a ton between these two options. I actually started writing it as one and then switched and then I switched back. The route that you decide to go here is mostly going to depend on what you want to do with your character when you're not heating yourself up and giving everyone hugs. If you want to do cleric-y things, whether that's healing or maybe better yet using spirit guardians and just holding enemies inside of that spell, which is actually going to be better in some ways damage-wise as it has a bigger radius and arguably a better damage type in radiant or maybe necrotic I guess. Uh, though Spirit Guardians is going to be a little worse in others as enemies get to save against it primarily as opposed to Heat Metal where they're just going to take the damage. Anyways, if you want to do those things, if you want access to other important Cleric spells like Revivify, stuff like that, then yes, absolutely, Forge Cleric works great here. It might even work better thematically. I think, as there's just something about a heavy armor wearing heated metal character that says forge to me. So yeah, knock yourself out, go that route if you want. But as much as I kind of hate doing it because I've been doing so many 
Bard builds lately, especially for Baldur's Gate 3. Drink. I think Bard is the better choice here. In a vacuum, anyways, not knowing what your other allies are playing as, right? For one, it's going to do slightly better sustainable damage since we can get extra attack without needing to grab extra attack from fighter, meaning we can scale our spell slots more quickly for better heat metal damage, right? But maybe even more importantly than that, Bards just get access to more and better spells, honestly. Clerics have some good ones, but the Bard list is just so much more versatile and powerful, in my opinion, for not only damage, but support, utility, and maybe especially control. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Bard here, but if you wanna go Cleric, you totally should and have no regrets. That's my credo, no regrets. Mm -hmm. Like not even a single letter. Assuming Bard then. At Bard 1, we get Bardic Inspiration, of course, which lets us use a bonus action to give a 1d6 Inspiration die that will scale to an ally of our choice, which they can use in the next 10 minutes to add to an attack roll, a saving throw, or an ability check of their choice. With a 14 Charisma, we only get two of these to give out per long rest for now, so not a ton. And yeah, is one good reason to consider going 16 Charisma and 14 Constitution instead of the other way around. Around, right? The other good reason, of course, is because our bard spells, which we get here, are usually impacted by our charisma modifier too. I'd grab a healing word for a nice bonus action ranged heal option, probably hideous laughter for some solid single target control, and then probably the most important first level spell for this build, yeah, silvery barbs. Ah! because it will let us cast the spell as a reaction when an enemy succeeds at an attack, a saving throw, or yes, an ability check, forcing them to re-roll and possibly fail, and in the current version of D&D, at least, trying to not be grappled requires an ability check. Later on, it'll be a saving throw. So this will be great for either, I guess. And yeah, this will potentially help ensure that our hug is more than a six second hug. It's gonna be like a 20 second hug, minimum. No quick, awkward, like patting on the back, homophobic hugs here. <laughs> Long and slow, baby. Someone's gonna take that out of context and make it a meme. Anyways, where was I? Um, Silvery Barbs is good. It also lets you give advantage to yourself or an ally on the next attack, save, or ability check. So yeah, that might mean our check, right, our ability check to keep them hugged. It's a really great spell to have here. At level three, we would be a bard two. That means we get Song of Rest, which lets us add an extra d6 of healing to anyone who spends hit dice to recover hit points during a short rest. Thank you very much. And Jack of All Trades, which lets us add half of our proficiency bonus rounded down to any ability check we make where we're not already adding our proficiency bonus. And yes, that includes initiative rolls for now, at least, which is really nice since we kind of dumped our dexterity. At level four, we would be a bard three, and here's another big reason to go bard over cleric, actually, because we, at bard three, get expertise. Now, we could have gotten expertise with a feat if we wanted, or maybe a level dip in rogue or even ranger, though we don't really have the ability scores to do that. Expertise is going to let us double our proficiency bonus in two skills that we are proficient in, and we, of course, are going to take athletics, since grapple checks require an athletics check to be made against an enemies, athletics, or acrobatics check. So we want to get that athletics bonus up as high as possible, right? As for the second skill to take here, we get expertise in two. I'd probably go perception, but you should pick your favorite, PYF. We also get second level spells here, and while Cloud of Daggers is potentially nice, especially for good grapplers, and Aid is a great health buff, there are two spells to highlight here. First up, Heat metal, of course. Now, shockingly, perhaps, I've never actually tried to build around this spell before. It's really pretty good. I've kind of mentioned it in passing a bunch, but let's go over the details of how the spell works. You cast it as an action. It requires your concentration and lasts for one minute. You cast it on a manufactured metal object, like armor, weapon, etc., and any creature in physical contact with the object takes 2d8 fire damage. On subsequent rounds, you can use a bonus action to just cause the damage again. Most people like to cast this on an enemy who's wearing a suit of metal armor, since doffing metal armor, right, taking it off, takes a long time. Meaning enemies are just gonna choose to keep trying to fight through the pain and it becomes free damage on them every round. But there are two weaknesses to the spell when we go this route. 
first off, once that enemy is dead, we don't get to like transfer it to someone else or anything. So it's kind of limited to a single enemy and most enemies don't survive all that long in 5e outside of your big bads, right? But second, of course, is that not all enemies wear metal armor. Maybe most enemies don't, depending on your setting and your campaign, I suppose. So again, the spell's pretty cool, but it's pretty niche, right? But what if we're the ones wearing the metal armor? Now, you might be wondering if raw rules as written, it would necessarily work for us to heat our own armor and grapple someone. Do they have to take the damage here? Obviously, as always, talk this over with your DM before you even start playing this character in a session zero or whatever, but yeah, I have a hard time imagining most DMs saying this doesn't work. The spell says that if someone comes into contact with the metal, they take the damage. And how is that not happening if we're grappling them in a full suit of metal armor. I mean, maybe if we were just wearing like a chain shirt or a breastplate, someone trying to argue that like they might not necessarily be touching the metal, I can kind of see, but if we're in a full suit of scale mail or plate, a grappled enemy is touching some part of the metal here and should take the damage. And in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be limited to one enemy, right? Any enemy who is in contact with the metal is going to take the damage. Okay. Finally, yes, the fire damage that they take from the spell here scales by 1d8 for every level that you upcast it. Now, at Bard 3, we also get our Bard College, our subclass, right? And again, you kind of could just go PYF here, pick your favorite. I think we should go Swords or Valor, and Swords is probably better, but you could totally go Glamour or Creation or Spirits or Whispers or Lore, actually, uh, would be a strong choice, or whatever you wanted, and it would work fine. Valor and Swords are going to give us extra attack, right? So that's going to make the spreadsheet happy. So I'm going to go Swords Bard here, but Valor is almost as good if you prefer that route. As a Swords Bard though, assuming we go that way, we get a fighting style and we don't actually need either of the fighting style choices that we get access to. We only get to choose between two weapon fighting and dueling and both of those require weapons and we're not using weapons. It's too bad they don't give like a defense option or maybe interception or something here. We also get blade flourishes, which are very nice. Uh, first off, the feature tells us that when we take the attack action, which we almost always will be, even when grappling. Uh, grappling is considered an attack, right? Then we get an extra 10 feet move speed increase until our next turn. But then also, these flourishes let us use our Bardic Inspiration to add some damage to our attacks and then get another benefit depending on the flourish that we use. Defensive Flourish adds both our Bardic Inspiration die in damage and to our armor class until our next turn. Kind of the go-to in 5e, I think. Mobile Flourish lets us push an enemy that we hit, which we don't really want to do lest they break our grapple and slashing flourish lets us do bardic inspiration damage both to the enemy we hit and to an enemy standing next to them quickly here you could i think make the argument that we wouldn't get to add the damage from flourishes to unarmed strikes on the one hand we're told that if a weapon attack you make as part of the attack action hits we can add one of the following flourishes. And unarmed strikes are considered weapon attacks, right? We've gone over this. But then the wording in the flourishes themselves say that they cause, among other things, the weapon to deal extra damage. So while we know that unarmed strikes are considered weapon attacks, we are also told pretty clearly that they are not weapons. They are totally gonna clear up this wonky wording in the next player's handbook, right? Please please tell me that they will. Anyways, I can see a strict rules as written reading that would indicate that you can do the extra thing from the flourish, like add to your armor class, for example, but not actually do the extra damage since we're not using a weapon. But I also would be shocked if more than like 1% of DMs out there argued that you don't get to add the damage. Let me know if you're in the 1%, you filthy one percenter. <laughs> that said, we only get to flourish two or three times per long rest right now, right? We've got like a 14 or a 16 charisma. They don't come back to us until we take a long rest. So I'm definitely not going to consider it as part of our sustained damage either way yet. Right. So level five. I mean, good news with expertise in athletics, heavy armor proficiency, the unarmed fighting style, and the heat metal spell, the core of the build is kind of complete early on here, right at level four. That's awesome. Let's then go back to fighter here at level five. We'd be a fighter two to improve our grappling primarily. That's going to give us the almighty action surge, letting us once per short rest take two actions instead of one uh, on a turn, right? This is nice for more attacking, sure, so like some burst damage, but for us, I think it would be best used to like grapple an enemy and cast heat metal 
metal right on round one, avoiding a setup round. If we manage to get chromatic warding going before combat, maybe, I guess, don't forget, here at this level, right, chromatic warding becomes usable once per day, giving us that sweet fire immunity. It does take an action to get going, so sure, maybe we can get it going before the fight starts, or maybe we do that, and then action surge and grapple. And then on round two, we're casting heat metal. At level six, we would be a fighter three, and that means we get our martial archetype, our fighter subclass, and we're going rune knight, of course, you knew this. My most used fighter subclass, I think? Probably that or battle master? I'm not quite sure. I am working on a table of contents for my builds that'll break every build down by class and subclass, among other things. I'm about halfway done. Anyways, yes, for grapplers, this is just the go-to subclass. Giant barbarian is really nice as well, but you can't concentrate on a spell like heat metal while raging, so here we are. As a rune knight then, we get two really fantastic features. Rune Carver lets us choose two runes from a really nice list that we can etch into our equipment somewhere and then activate them once per short rest for great effect. The two that I would go with here would be Cloud Rune, of course, which lets you use your reaction to redirect an attack from an enemy to hit someone else, ideally another enemy, and that's just super potent. But then I'd want to take Frost Rune here as well. It lets us increase our strength and constitution save saving throws and checks. So perfect to help us both hold on to our concentration and succeed on our grapple checks. Unfortunately, it does cost a bonus action to activate, but it lasts 10 minutes. If you can get it off before combat starts, great. If not, it might be a little bit difficult to use, but you're gonna wanna use it if you're going up against enemies who are looking either really strong or particularly acrobatic, right? Nice tool to have in our tool belt. More importantly, of course, as a rune knight here, we get Giant's Might, which lets us, proficiency bonus times per day, use a bonus action to grow to large size for one minute. This is super important if we run into huge creatures, since if you recall, we can only grapple enemies that are one size larger than ourselves or smaller. We are medium, meaning that up until this point, we could only grapple large creatures. Not often a major problem, you know, at level six in the game, but Huge creatures might be coming, you know, slightly more frequent from this point on, so I'm happy to have a way to grapple them. I guess that actually reminds me, I forgot to mention, at Bard 3, we could pick up the Enlarge Reduce spell, right? That's another reason that I favored Bard over Cleric, actually. Uh, the spell requires concentration, so we couldn't use it and Heat Metal, but yeah, it could let us grow one size larger, meaning that if we activate Giant's Might first, we could then cast Enlarge Reduce after that and take us from large to huge, letting us grapple even even gargantuan creatures, the biggest in the game. So that would be really fun to whip out if you really needed it and like grappling your enemy was more important than doing some heat metal damage. Anyways, Giant's Might also importantly gives us advantage on strength checks and saves when we use it. Perfect, right? That's gonna be advantage on our grapple checks and lets us do an extra D6 of damage once per turn on attacks with a weapon or with unarmed strikes. Thank you for the clarification in the wording there. And so at level six, it is time for our first First damage report. Let's get into what combat is going to look like for us right now. Unfortunately, as you may have detected, yeah, we've got some setup to go through if we want to be firing, pun intended, on all cylinders. Round one, or if we're lucky, before combat starts, we're activating our fire immunity, right? As a bonus action, then I would probably use Giant's Might if we have enough uses of it left, or if we're not going up against huge creatures, feel free to maybe use Frost Rune as your first bonus action there instead. If you have to choose between one or the other, Giant's Might is going to be a little bit stronger for our grapple checks and for our damage. And, you know, I mean, we should mention at this point, with a plus three from strength and expertise in athletics, we've got a plus nine to our grapple checks at level six. If we have Giant's Might going, those checks will be with advantage. If we've got the Frost Rune going, we've got a plus 11. We are very rarely not going to have our enemy grappled. I'm going to assume 90% of the time they're grappled. Feel free to adjust those numbers down if you want. But once we've got our immunity turned on and and an enemy grappled, right? Go ahead and light them up. Cast heat metal on yourself and watch them burn. So we're talking round one, bonus action giant's might, make yourself immune to fire damage and action surge if you've got it, grapple an enemy. Round two, with your action you're casting heat metal, bonus action, frost rune if you need it. On subsequent rounds, you're gonna be grappling an additional enemy if you can. Remember, you need a free hand to grapple, and we've got two. You might as well control and damage two at a time if you can, right? And then once you've got two enemies grappled, sure, 
sure, start making unarmed strikes. Remember, you don't need to make those with your fist. It can be a headbutt, it can be a knee, etc. It's glorious. And don't forget, at the beginning of our turn, we get a free d4 of damage to a grappled enemy thanks to the unarmed fighting style. And yes, the best part about heat metal is that the enemy doesn't get to save against the damage. If we've got them grappled, they are taking the damage. Altogether then, once we're going full blast, we would be doing 2d8 fire damage to two targets. And yes, I am going to compare this build to other multi-target damage dealers, plus a d4 to one of them, right? Plus a 1d8 plus three for our strength modifier from from an unarmed strike, plus another d6 from Giant's Might for a grand total of 5d8 plus 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 3. And again, I'm assuming here that there is a 90% chance that you've got them grappled. And so, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would do 29 damage per round on average, and against a 15 AC, it would be 26 DPR. And yeah, compared to other multi-target sustained damage dealers that I've done to date, that's not amazing. Bottom of the barrel, you know, for that group. But you're controlling two enemies. Please don't forget that. A lot of the strength and the power of the build lies in that control. And also, you will know Notice. If you look at the spreadsheet, uh, check the links in the video description. I put out spreadsheets for every build, right? As well as links to the mega spreadsheet that like compares all of the similar builds that I've done to one another. Anyways, if you notice the graph, right, that damage line is very flat. As the enemy AC increases, the damage stays almost the same. And yeah, that's because most of our damage is just automatic so long as we've got them grappled. That's awesome. So let's see where we can take it from here. At level seven, with Rune Knight under our belt, uh, something that we definitely needed to be the best grappler that we could be, let's go back to Bard. That would make us a Bard four, and that means we get our first ability score, increase, or feat, and there are actually a lot of ways that we could go with this feat here. Remember I started with a 17 strength, so I want a half feat here that's gonna let us bump our strength by one and give us some other nice benefits, and there are several that I'd love to have. Heavy Armor Master might be near the top of the list. Uh, it would reduce damage that we're taking, right? Odds are we're getting attacked a lot since most enemies that we've got grappled are not going to be able to escape our grapple and are probably just then going to decide to attack us instead. Being able to consistently reduce that damage from Heavy Armor Master would be really nice. If we went Cleric instead of Bard for this build, we would want to take Skill Expert here to bump our strength to 18 and then get expertise in athletics, right? Alternatively, now, we could have just gone with like a 16 Strength, a 16 Constitution, and a 16 Charisma at level one, right? Uh, just giving ourselves a plus one to three ability scores that we can do ever since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And then here for our ability score increase your feet, I just take a plus two to strength. In the end, I think my favorite route, mostly for flavor though, is to go with the Dragon Fear feat. It requires that you be Dragonborn, but then lets us bump our strength by one and tells us that we can replace our breath weapon attack with a roar that forces enemies within 30 feet of us, to nice range, to make a wisdom saving throw, the DC for which is based on our charisma score. Not bad for us. And anyone who fails that save is going to be frightened of us for one whole minute, and they only get to make another save against that frightened condition if they take damage. Frightened is pretty great, meaning they can't move closer to us of their own free will and have disadvantage on all ability checks, like trying not to be grappled, for example, and attack rolls. It's just really potent. It has great synergy with the build, and it's even better when coupled with the newer versions of Dragonborns, right? Since we can use our breath attack to replace one of our attacks once we get extra attack here in a minute. I don't know, I just really love the idea of this red dragonborn in full plate whose armor is glowing red hot and they're just in your face, burning you to death while holding you in their vice-like grip and you're just terrified, unable to do anything effectively. And your friends are all like looking over at you going, I mean, I wanna help, but I ain't going near that guy. <laughs> it's just dripping with flavor. It's delicious. Anyways, at level eight, we would be a bard five, and that means we get uh, third level bard spells. And while there are a million amazing options, I'm gonna say something you're going to start hearing a lot from me going forward on this build, PYF. Uh, pick your favorites. Catnap and Tiny Hut are fantastic utility options. Dispel Magic is always great to have when you need it. Fear, Hypnotic Pattern, and Slow are all incredible control spells. I even kinda love Antagonize for this build. It's a new spell. It comes to us from the recent uh, Book of 
many things. We cast the spell as an action, the target has to make a wisdom save, and if they fail, they take 4d4 psychic damage, it's not a ton, but then have to immediately use their reaction to make a melee attack against another creature of our choice that we can see. And we've got two enemies grappled together. I just love the idea of making one of them hit the other one. We can kind of already do this with the cloud rune, right? So now it's like the one baddie is forced to attack his friend with the cloud rune, and then we use antagonize to make that guy that just got attacked attack his friend back. We're grappling them, we're burning them, and then like using their arms to just punch each other. Ultimate bully mode enabled. Tammy, that's enough! Anyways, we don't need any of these spells to improve the build's like core concept, but yeah, we can only make ourselves immune to fire damage once per long rest. And even at tables like mine, where we typically only have one or two combat encounters per day, you're likely going to be looking to do something other than heat metal on yourself and grapple fairly regularly, right? And I just think that bards have more and better options for that. Though, like we talked about, Spirit Guardians is a great backup concentration spell if you'd rather stay focused on grappling and doing damage instead of throwing out like a hypnotic pattern or a fear or a slow or something, right? But bards get clouded daggers, which I like to make use of fairly frequently. So anyways, either route works. The other thing that makes level five bard so great for us is the buffs that we get to our inspiration. First up, the inspiration die bump up to a d8 here, which is nice, but even better, we get Font of Inspiration, and that means that we'll be able to either throw out inspiration to our allies more often, probably when we're not doing our grapple and burn technique, right, since activating heat metal every round takes our bonus action. Alternatively, that might mean that we're getting more uses of defensive and or slashing flourish more regularly to help finish off our two grappled enemies more quickly. At level 9, we would be a bard 6, and that means we finally get extra attack so that we can make two attacks when we take the attack action. And while sure, that can mean like making a couple of unarmed strikes on our turn, it could also mean grappling two enemies in the same turn, right? Because attempting a grapple is replacing one of our attacks. Or maybe grappling one enemy and then shoving them prone with our second attack. Because as every good grappler knows, a grappled and prone enemy can't move to try and stand up, and so all attacks within five feet are going to have advantage. I considered assuming that we had advantage when crunching numbers, but needing to take another round to knock our enemies prone in a build where we kind of already have a lot of setup didn't seem super smart. Maybe against a really high priority target that's going to live for a while, sure, to give you and your melee allies advantage on attacks against them, right? But when we're talking like minions, I think we'd rather just try and hit them than take the time to knock them prone, personally. Extra attack also could, yes, let us attack once and then shoot out a line of fire or roar to make everyone afraid. It just really increases the things that we are able to do on a single turn. And we also get counter charm at this level, which is pretty crappy, so I'm not even gonna talk about it. <laughs> right, at level nine, it's time for our next damage report. Since last check, we've gotten third level spells for more burn damage, if we wanted to upscale, right? We've gotten extra attack for more unarmed strikes, potentially, eventually, anyways, and increased our strength modifier by one. Perhaps more importantly, though these things won't show up in the spreadsheets, we've increased our utility, support, control, and burst damage options a ton, thanks to more and better inspirations, third level spells, and a fierce draconic roar. I'm still assuming a 90% chance to grapple, though right now we're at a plus 12 to our grapple checks, plus 14 if we're using our frost rune with advantage. <sighs> Maybe I should change it to like a 99% chance. I don't know, whatever. Against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we are going to be doing 47 damage per round on average, and against a 16 AC, it would be 42 DPR. And that's almost double since last check. Very nice. But again, damage-wise, still at the bottom of the pack compared to other multi-target sustained damage dealers that I've built to date, but with a level of control that almost none of them have, and a fantastic variety in playstyle to boot. Grappling and burning sometimes, controlling and buffing at others. Make no mistake, we we are having so much fun with this character. At least I am, I don't know about you. At level 10, we would be a bard 7, and that means we get 4th level spells, and again, I mean, Polymorph, Dimension Door, I actually kinda really like Ralathim's Psychic Lance as a 4th level spell for some on-demand burst damage plus incapacitation, but yeah. PYF. Nothing uh, here is going to change up our core combo, right? At level 11, we would be a bard 8, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat, and I 
think we've got to bump our strength to 20 here and cap it. Of course, we would love to have more charisma. Maybe more importantly, we should be thinking about ways to get past fire resistance or even fire immunity, right? So, so yeah, we could take Elemental Adept here, right? And that would let us ignore anyone who has fire resistance, uh, plus do a teeny weeny little bit more of damage. It just says that when we do fire damage and we roll a one, we can just consider it a two. I think I'd be more worried about fire resistance if we were doing our like burn people with a warm hug shtick more than one once per day, but as is, we're kind of already used to dealing with not casting heat metal on ourselves during combat encounters, right? So if we run into fire immunity or fire resistant enemies, it would be pretty easy to do what we typically do when we're out of our once per day fire immunity and just start throwing down like hard control spells, etc. And strength, on the other hand, is so important both for our damage and for our grappling that yeah, I think I'm going to prioritize it here. At level 12, we would be a bard 9 and that means we get 5th level spells. What spells are we going to pick? Our favorites, of course, PYF. Animate Objects is probably the new go-to for damage when we're out of fire immunity for the day, letting us get a bunch of like animated coins or forks or whatever to make attacks for us, right? Um, Awaken can be great if you can actually convince the tree that you bring to life to fight for you. Dominate Person and Hold Monster are fantastic control options. Greater Restoration is kind of a must-have cure-all for support-focused characters anyways. Synaptic Static is a favorite spell of mine, both to do fireball-like damage with a fantastic debuff thrown in. It's almost like a fireball plus bane on steroids. I love it. But yeah, nothing that's going to augment our warm hug, really. So at level 13, we would be a bard 10, and that means our bardic inspiration die goes up to a d10, first of all, which is going to be nice for damage and for helping out our allies. And then we get expertise part two, and yeah, Pick your favorite two skills now that uh, you have proficiency in to double the proficiency bonus again. I think if it were me, I'd probably go performance and persuasion, maybe. We are a bard, after all, but do what makes the most sense for your character at your table. But then, at Bard 10, we get that amazing feature, Magical Secrets. And this is just another fantastic reason for going bard over cleric, I think. The sheer versatility that we have is just off the charts, and nowhere is that made more apparent than with magical secrets, right? So now we get to take any two spells of fifth level or lower from any class and learn them as bard spells. It almost seems kind of silly as a first level spell, but shield should probably be considered here unless you'd rather just like dip into another class to get it. Probably sorcerer for us. Other than that, I mean, wall of force is one of the best control spells in game. Aura of vitality is fantastic for healing, especially between combat encounters. Find greater steed is a classic uh, magical secrets choice here, right? If you want to have a pet griffin. I mean, heck, you could even grab spirit guardians here and now you're not sad that you didn't go cleric. You can heat metal when you've got fire immunity and spirit guardians when you don't. As per usual lately here, just PYF and have fun with your versatility. Let me know which spells I missed. What would you take? But at level 13, it is time for our next damage report. Since last check, we have capped our strength modifier and increased our heat metal damage, potentially if we wanted to use a fifth level spell slot for it anyways, up to 5d8 per enemy grappled per turn. And of course, as a mostly bard, we've also augmented our support, control, and utility by heaps as well. For the record, we are now sitting at a plus 15 to our grapple decks, probably with advantage and probably plus two more from Frost Rune for 17. There is no way that enemies are not grappled by us at this point, right? I mean, it's not a 0% chance that we fail to grapple them, but surely it's not a 10% chance, is it? Yeah. I'll continue to assume a 90% chance, I guess. And so, against enemies with a 10 AC, we would on average here do 65 damage per round, and against enemies with a 17 armor class, it would be 60 DPR. And par for the course, while that is a nice increase since last check, we're still at the bottom of the heap compared to other multi-target sustained damage builds that I've done to date, until you get into like the higher enemy armor classes at least, and that's been true since level 6, really. And despite that, I still think the build is incredibly powerful 
powerful due to its versatility and control and nearly guaranteed damage. At level 14, we would be a Bard 11, and that means we get sixth level spells. And for once, I don't think I can say pick your favorite here for sixth level spells. I feel compelled to say that while there are plenty of interesting options, surely you should take Mass Suggestion. Maybe Hero's Feast instead for a great, like, day long, party wide mega buff. But Mass Suggestion is just a potentially encounter ending control spell that doesn't even require concentration. It's sort of like an I win button, depending on how many enemies make their save against it, I guess, and what you actually suggest that they do. At level 15, we would be a bard 12, and that means we get another ability score increase or feat, and there are way too many options to choose from here. Elemental Adept is probably the go-to choice now, I think, letting you get around fire resistance and get a teeny tiny bump to damage because, like I said, it lets us treat any ones we roll for fire damage as twos. You know, that said, raising our constitution would not be a bad choice here for both our health and our concentration checks, right? Increasing charisma might actually be the thing that I would do if I were playing this character in game to make our spells a little more potent and to give us more inspirations. You know, taking resilient wisdom would not be a bad idea either to buff a really weak up to this point, but very important saving throw for us, right? Anyways, pick your favorite. I'll assume that we went elemental adept just because we get a teeny tiny damage bump from it, primarily. Spreadsheet. At level 16, we would be a bard 13, and that means we get 7th level spells, and we do not get to pick our favorites here, unless our favorite is Force Cage, because we have to take that spell. It's a concentration-free, improved wall of force. Come on, you cannot say no to that. Convince me that I'm wrong. At level 17, we would be a bard 14, and as badly as I've been wanting to take another level in fighter this whole time to get another much needed feat or ability score increase, I had to keep my eyes on the prize. And by it, go. <laughs> the prize that is Bard 14. And now that we're finally here, I am so glad that I held strong because that means that we get the Swords Bard's like capstone feature, right? Master's Flourish. And it is awesome. It tells us that if we want to not spend a use of our inspiration, we can instead just flourish once per round for free, but uh, using a d6 for the die instead of a d10 here. And heck yeah, I want to. You know, we can still only flourish once per turn, unlike in Baldur's Gate 3, take a drink, which is a bummer, but assuming that we use Slashing Flourish, though arguably we should be using Defensive, but you know me, always exploring what's possible damage-wise, uh, Slashing Flourish is going to let us add a d6 in damage to both our primary target and their friend, who we have grappled in our other arm. Not crazy damage, but it is actually finally sustainable. Now, I'll take it. Save those inspirations for our friends. Also, at Bard 14, we get another round of Magical Secrets, making Bard 14 one of the best bard levels ever. So yeah, any 7th level spell or lower now from any class's spell list, right? Oof. I mean, I'm thinking contingency for a nice, like, break glass in case of emergency option. I mean, we might be able to make the contingency cast heat metal on myself when I grapple someone or something. Uh, that might not quite fly, rules as written, since the contingency spell is supposed to be able to target yourself, and technically we're casting heat metal on our armor, right? I have a feeling that most DMs would allow it. It would save us an action if we could, and, you know, we could potentially set this up during, like, downtime, use a 6th level spell slot for contingency to cast a 7th level spell slot for heat metal that both get used when we cast the contingency spell, right? But then it lasts for 10 days, and if the trigger happens anytime in the next 10 days, then contingency, free heat metal at the seventh level. That would be really nice. But I mean, there's other options we could choose from here. Draconic transformations, probably my favorite. I mean, come on, we're a dragonborn. How do we not take this spell? It gives us all kinds of dragony buffs to ourselves, including wings to fly and a bonus action 60 foot cone breath attack that does 6d8 damage. Just like totally the dragonborn, like finally realizing their ultimate draconic potential. I love it. Of course, there's heal, one of the best, most efficient in combat heal spells in the game. Or sure, of course, the broken and overpowered simulacrum. If you want a little like snowman version of yourself, assuming that you've got the time and the gold to create it. Anyways, yeah, again, let me know if I missed any that you think we ought to take here, but um, go ahead and PYF. And that is going to bring us to our final damage report. 
Since last check, our biggest increase to damage has come in the form of being able to upcast Heat Metal as a 7th level spell now, if we were foolish enough to actually spend a 7th level spell on it, that is. But hey, maybe there will be a reason for it once in a while, or maybe you used Contingency during some downtime, I don't know. But we also did pick up an extra 2d6 of damage, potentially, thanks to Master's Flourish. More than that, though, we've just continued to give ourselves incredible support, utility, and control options via all those lovely high-level spells. And yeah, I'll assume that we took Elemental Adept for our feet, so we get that teeny weeny damage increase. We're now sitting, by the way, on a plus 17 to our grapple checks unbuffed. Plus 19 with Frostrun. Plus advantage. Ridiculous. And so, against enemies with a 10 armor class here, we would on average do 97. DPR, so close to that centennial barrier. Though we will pass 100, right? 97 is just an average. Uh, and against an enemy AC of 18, it's going to be 91 DPR on average. And so, compared to other multi target sustained damage builds that I've done to date, we're still hanging out at the bottom until you get to about here. For us, it's like a 21 uh, enemy AC or so. And then we start pulling ahead against most of them. Uh, and that actually brings me to my final thoughts. Because the tier score for this build is only a 54, uh, bottom of the pack for these multi-target sustained damage builds, right? But, you know, similar to what I've been running into with some of my builds recently, that number, as we know, doesn't do a great job of telling the full story. When I started giving builds a tier score, I was just looking for something easy and not time consuming. It wasn't meant to be any kind of like objective ranking system. I just needed a way to kind of give a general idea of what kind of damage a character might be dealing across a huge swath of potential enemy armor classes, and in some cases, bonuses to their saving throws, right? Because, I mean, in D&D we run into enemies with a huge variety of ACs and saving throw bonuses, right? But the reality, as many of you like to point out to me frequently, is that this overly simplified system should probably be weighted to favor armor classes that we actually run into most often, depending on the level, right? And maybe even weighted to give more credence to the damage that we're doing at the levels most of us are actually playing the game at, up until, you know, level 10 or 11 or so, and maybe less importance to the level 17 damage report. I have not done any kind of weightedness to the system. I don't think that I will do that, uh, I don't know, maybe one day, but yeah, this is a great reminder to take that score with a huge grain of salt, a salt shaker's worth of salt in some cases, because, I mean, for this build, let's take level 9, for example. Compared to other builds, sure, against a 10 AC, we're getting destroyed damage-wise, but against an AC of, like, 18 or 19, we're pretty average by comparison compared to other multi-target damage builds, thanks to the fact that our heat metal damage just happens if they're grappled, which they will be. And an enemy AC of 18 or 19 at character level 9 is not particularly high, right? This is all to say that the actual in-game damage we can expect to do with this build during most combat encounters is actually pretty decent. And not to beat a dead horse, but when you couple that with the really great control that we bring via grappling and the versatility and the power that we bring via everything else we can do in the form of control spells and utility and inspirations and other support options, this build is fantastic. But maybe best of all, it's just oozing flavor and fun. A red dragonborn who stokes their draconic fire to the point that their armor could fry an egg, who grows to a giant-like stature, puts you in a chokehold to scald your face off while headbutting you into submission and striking fear into the heart of nearly every other enemy on the battlefield with their furious death knell of a roar? Sign me up. So, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really want to play this in game. I think it would be a ton of fun. And it's just, I don't know, it's pretty unique and a little crazy. And maybe that's why I love it. But I also love you. So thank you for being here and for all that you do for me and for the channel. I hope you have a fantastic day and a really great week. And if you don't, please hang in there. But I also hope that you will do good and be kind. And that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye. Hmm, what fire-themed song should we sing for the outtakes this week? <laughs> I'm hot-blooded, check it and see. <laughs> nah, how about, uh, ooh, 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 I'm on fire. Little Bruce Springsteen. Oh, I love that song, but it can be a little creepy sometimes. 
I'm gonna go with I come to you with strange fire I make an offering of love The incense of my soil is burned By the fire in my blood <laughs> I come to you with strange fire ah. Ooh, now I want to listen to some Indigo Girls. Spring. The springtime is the best time to listen to the Indigo Girls, as far as I'm concerned. Because all of my favorite songs of theirs are usually so, hmm, like, inspiring and, like, happy. Even though they've got plenty of kind of angry and sad songs, too. I don't know. Anyways, gonna be good today, right? Hmm, mm-hmm. No slipping, no drooping. Ooh, check out the um, Eye of the Beholder barbershop, because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as we all know. Must be the place where I go to get my hair cut. <laughs> Judging by the number of criticisms I get in the comments about my hair. If you were to ask me the number one thing that kind of is most surprising about the, the semi-frequent comments that I get, it's, yeah, like the number of people that want to talk about my hair. <laughs> Usually because they don't like something about it. It's it's really strange. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just would not have anticipated that. Short hair, long hair, it doesn't matter. I care too much about my hair. I look like some person that they don't like. I don't know. Anyway, I can't like do the video like this the whole time so you can see the beholder. <laughs> Scoot back, maybe. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Had something in my teeth there. <laughs> Let's start that over. I will tell you as soon as my mic stops sagging. Stop, why are you saggy? Some days you're happy, some days you're sad. Why are you so sad? Come on, I was singing Indigo Girls earlier. Are you telling me you don't like Indigo Girls? Then I might need to get a new mic. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Candle down. And we can just kind of force enemies to touch us where we're hot. <laughs> oh, sorry. This episode is getting a little randy, isn't it? All this talk about fire and heat. With athletics in expertise... Uh, well, sorry, I say that wrong. Wow. Come on, brain. <laughs> Sweaty. I, I, my, my office here is in a, like a WeWork type um, multi-office building, right? And unfortunately, I don't have the thermostat in my office, and the person who does runs cold. So that means they've always got the heat cranked up. And it makes me sad. Mm, it smells good in here. Somebody must be drooling. <laughs> drooling? Somebody must be burning a woodsy, patchouli-scented candle. I love it. That screw up my... Ugh, stupid bump. I always think that I have it set up right, and then inevitably, 30 minutes in, it falls. <clears throat> yeah, gotcha. Thanks. Or maybe better yet. Or, yeah, sure, the broken and overpowered simulate. Simulate. Okay, that's a tongue twister. Alright, that's a wrap.